we ask this in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, uh, I have with me this morning an artifact from the, from the 1980s. And um, if, if you didn't live it, this is what's called a cassette tape. And uh, from 1985, which is the year it overtook vinyl records, to the year 1992, when CDs overtook the cassette tape, this was the primary medium used to distribute recorded music. And you could take one of these and you could put it in your tape deck and, and you could listen to the music that was recorded on it. And when the tape ended, you could rewind the tape and listen to it all over again. And you could do that over and over. You'd listen, rewind, listen. But, but you could also eject the tape from the tape deck, flip it over, put it back in, and you could listen to the other side, the B side of the cassette, and you'd find other songs on that side. And I have this cassette with me this morning because the book of Ecclesiastes is like this. The book of Ecclesiastes, most people, they read it and they remember the song that is on the A side of the book. Now, the lyrics to that song go like this. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's a song saying that our lives are vain. They're like a vapor. They have no substance or staying power. Our lives are short, and when we die, we will soon be forgotten. And most people, what they do is they read through the book and they hear that theme and they say, yeah, that's the way I feel. And then they rewind the tape. Maybe they read the book again and they listen to that song again. But there's actually a, a B-side to this book. There is a second chorus in the book of Ecclesiastes. And I wonder if you know the lyrics to that song. But because that song shows us where joy can be found right here right now on this side of heaven. And I imagine many of you are like me. You, you, uh, you sometimes struggle to find joy in life. And so on your best days, there's a bit of discontent. Most days, there's a hint of despair. And maybe on your worst days, you sometimes contemplate death. And so what I want you to know this morning is that there is a way to kind of flip life over and live life on the B side, where there is joy. And we can find that joy by listening to the B side of the book of Ecclesiastes this morning. And so if you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. If you've got a digital device you can use to pull up the scriptures, I'd encourage you to search for the ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, that's the English translation I'll be reading from this morning. And so if on that digital device you search Ecclesiastes 2 ESV, you'll be able to follow right along with me. And I'm going to begin reading there in verse 24. We read this. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God is given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he is given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. And this is God's word to us today. And the word vanity appears 32 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the book opens in chapter 1, verse 1, with vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the book closes in chapter 12, verse 8, with vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And so from beginning to end of the book of Ecclesiastes, the dominant theme is life is vain. Our lives are short. We will soon be forgotten when we die. And most people, that's what they remember from this book. But there is a second chorus. There is a B-side to the book of Ecclesiastes that says, hey, it's true, life is vain. But even so, joy can be found in life. And we find the lyrics to that second chorus for the first time in the verses that are in front of us this morning. Uh, look there at verse 24. 
we're told there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. Uh, We find the chorus again in chapter 3, verse 12. The writer says, I perceive that there is nothing better, nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. We see it again in chapter 3, verse 22. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Find it again in chapter 5, verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. We find it again in chapter 8, verse 15. The writer says, I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. You see that there is the dominant theme, the A side of Ecclesiastes that says life is vain. It's short, will soon be forgotten when we die. But there is a second song, isn't there? A second chorus that occurs over and over in the book. And it says, hey, joy can be found in life. And that's why God has given us the book of Ecclesiastes. So that we would see where we can find joy in this life. And so I want us to take some time this morning to listen to the song on the B-side of the book. Because track one shows us that joy isn't something we create. Joy is a gift that is given to us from the hand of God. And Notice there in chapter 2, verse 24, the writer says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from what? The hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? The Bible makes clear that God is sovereign. That means that God is in control of all things. The Bible shows us that God is in control of the weather. God sends rain to water the earth. God sends drought to remind us of our dependence upon him. God is in control of the womb. It's God who has given us children. It's God who has knitted each and every one of us together in our mother's womb. The Bible shows us that God is in control of the big things, that there isn't a single person that comes to power in any part of the planet apart from God's will. And Jesus himself reminds us that God is in control of the little things too. That there is not a bird that falls from the sky apart from your Father's will. God is sovereign. He is in control of all things. And that includes whether you have joy. And we lose sight of that, don't we? We tend to think when we lose joy uh, that we've got to find it. We've got to create it. And so we rush off to buy some new clothes or buy that new car or try to get more likes on Insta or uh, we try to go on that vacation or get that promotion. Whatever it is that we think is going to bring us joy. But what the book of Ecclesiastes is showing us is that the more you try to run after joy, the farther you'll find it is from your reach. Some of you, you're on the career climb right now. And you're trying to climb in your career because you believe that the more success you have in your job, the more joy you will have in your life. But every step you take up that corporate ladder takes another piece of yourself, doesn't it? You take that step and now there's more travel, more time away from your family and friends. 
take a step and there's more responsibility, that means more stress. You've bought into the idea that if you could just reach the pinnacle of your career, you'd have the pinnacle of joy. But we have a saying, don't we? That it is lonely at the top. You know, about a month ago, uh, Jason Kelsey was on the big podcast with Shaq. And uh, Shaq kind of opened up about the depression that hit him when he retired from basketball. And Shaq said to Jason Kelsey, he said, man, as you get ready to retire, enjoy your family. He said, I made a lot of mistakes. I lost my family. I lost everyone. Now I'm living in a 100,000 square foot home all by myself. We often chase after things that we think will bring us joy only to find the more we run after joy, the farther it is from our reach. And so what this track is showing us is that we've got to treat losing our joy the way you would treat being lost in the woods. Because if you're out hiking and you find that you've lost the path and now you're lost in the woods, what is your first instinct? First instinct is, man, I, I got to wander around. I, I know that path is just over there in that direction. I'll, I'll walk that way and I'll find the path. I'll get myself out of the jam. I'll save myself. But what every survival expert will tell you is that when you find yourself lost in the woods, what do you need to do? You stop and you stay in place and you wait for rescue to arrive. Because the more you wander, the more your chances of survival diminish. If you wander just one mile after you realize you're lost, because you don't, you know, you think the path is in that direction, but you're not sure, you wander one mile, now the search area has increased to three square miles. You wander just two miles, the search area has increased to 12 square miles. And so when you realize that you are lost in the woods, you've got to stop, you stay put, and you wait for rescue to arrive. And what this track is showing us is that when you lose your joy, you've got to treat it like you're lost in the woods. Instead of wandering around, chasing after things, like I'm going to find joy, I'm going to create it on my own, you've got to stop and you've got to say, God, I am sorry that I have kind of fallen into this trap of believing that I could create my own joy. That if I chased after this thing or that thing, that would bring joy to my life. I thought I could create joy. God, I have come to understand and to realize that joy is not something I create. It is a gift given to me from your hand. And so, God, I'm going to stop chasing things. I understand I've lost my joy. I'm going to sit right where I am. And I'm asking you, God, would you give me joy? I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait for rescue to arrive. Track one shows us that joy isn't something you create. It is a gift from the hand of God. You've got to treat losing your joy the way you treat being lost in the woods. You stop and you wait for rescue to arrive. Track two on the B-side shows us that joy doesn't come from an easy life. Joy is found in everyday life. Now look again at verse 24. The writer says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his what? Toil. Now this isn't the word for just work. I mean, there's a word for that. Uh, th this is the word for hard work, difficult work, wearisome work. And we are tempted, aren't we, to think, you know, I'd have more joy in my life if my life was just easier. The problem is my life is hard, and if my life wasn't hard, then I'd have joy. But what this is saying is joy isn't found in an easier life. Joy can be found amidst the struggles, amidst the toil of everyday existence. And so the million-dollar question is, well, how? Because I want to have it. And the consistent message of this book is that joy is found in everyday life when our heart transitions from grasping to gratitude. When your heart transitions from grasping to gratitude. When Lindsay and I were engaged to be married, uh, my mom and dad voiced one concern. Uh, their concern was that Lindsay and I both tend to be tight with money, and they were afraid that we would hold on to our money so tightly that we would lose our joy. 
I heard that concern. It kind of just, you know, went on. Lindsay and I got married. We got jobs. There was work to do. We had money to pay our bills, but there wasn't much money to do much beyond that. Well, we saved what little we could. We just sort of pressed on. And our lives were hard early on. Our young dog got cancer and died. And then my dad got cancer and died. And we lost our first child, the miscarriage. And in circumstances like that, I'll tell you, it is easy to lose your joy. And then one day I'm reading through Ecclesiastes and the B side of the book just hits me and hits me hard. And I had to come to Lindsay and say, Lindsay, I, I have failed in the leadership of our family because I thought that faithfulness to the Lord in our finances meant we saved every penny. But what Ecclesiastes is showing me is that faithfulness to the Lord in our finances means that we spend money to the glory of God. And all God's people said, amen. You know, some of you are like, yes, I, I want to spend money. But look, that's what it says, verse 24. There is nothing better, nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. The point of that is if all you ever do is you work and you work and you work and you never enjoy the fruit of your work, you're going to have little joy in life. You know, if your attitude is I'm going to save and I'm going to save and I'm, then I'm going to retire and then I'm going to enjoy life, you're going to be low on joy. And so for us, there wasn't much money coming in. There wasn't much money that could go out. But what we did is we got together and we set a budget and we said, okay, we're going to make ourselves spend this much money every month just for something fun to the glory of God. And that might mean once a month I, I bought a box of Popeye's chicken and and as I ate that chicken, I prayed to the Lord and I said, God, thank you for providing not only what I need, but also this good food for me to enjoy. It might mean uh, we got to watch a movie and before the movie, I could pray and say, God, thank you that we have the ability to go in here and watch this film. It might mean that I could download a song from iTunes and as I listen to the music, I could say, God, thank you for the gift of music and the ability to enjoy it. And whether it was eating chicken or watching a movie or listening to music, it was done to the worship of God because it was received from his hand as a good gift with gratitude. And so some of you here, you might be like me and Lindsay, and you might be really tight with your money. And what you've got to do is you, you ought to go home this afternoon and say, man, we got to set a budget to force ourselves to spend some money to have fun to the glory of God. And you got to just lift your voices up to the Lord and say, God, forgive us for the way in which we have treated you like you are a miserly old man rather than a generous and gracious God. Forgive us for the way in which we have not spent any money because we fear that we, we've created this wealth and we've got to protect this wealth rather than seeing that you have given us this wealth and Lord, you will protect it and protect us. Others of you, though, <laughs> others of you, you have been grasping for joy by spending money that you do not have. You know, you've, you've been saying, I, I just want to have joy in life, and, and this thing or that thing will make me happy. And even though I don't have the money right now to buy it, I'll just buy that thing, and I'll get the joy. And so what you've got to do is you've got to go home this afternoon, and you've got to set a budget so that you can get your finances in order. Because what you have found is not joy, you found debt. And you've got to lift your voice up to the Lord and you've got to say, Father, forgive us. Forgive us for the way in which we haven't been grateful for all that you've given to us. We have felt that what you've given to us is not enough for us to be happy in life. And so we've got to spend money we do not have to buy things we shouldn't be purchasing. You see how both the, the person who never spends and the person who overspends are guilty of a lack of gratitude in their heart? See how that works? The, the person who never spends, they, they act as though God is some miserly old man. Hey, uh, God, you, you haven't given us all these good things in life to enjoy. 
The person who overspends, they're saying, God, I'm not grateful for what you've given to me because you have shortchanged me and I need more if I'm going to be happy. And so both the person who never spends and the person who overspends, they are both operating from the same sinful disposition of a lack of gratitude in their heart. And as a result, there will be a lack of joy. And what the track shows us is that joy doesn't come from an easier life. It is found in everyday life as our hearts transition from a posture of grasping to one of gratitude. But there's a, a third track in this book. And the third track shows us that if you're going to see good in your work, God's got to see good in you. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about how that phrase, the Hebrew phrase translated by the ESV in verse 24 as find enjoyment is the same Hebrew phrase that is found in Genesis chapter 1. Now, there in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, God said, let there be light and there was light. And then in verse 4, we read, and God saw that the light was good. And that's the same Hebrew phrase we find here in verse 24, translated find enjoyment. There is this cadence that happens throughout Genesis chapter 1 where God creates, he goes to work, he makes something, he steps back, he looks at what he made, and he says, man, that's some good work if I do say so myself. And what we are going to do if we're going to find joy in life and in our work, we've got to work the way God works. Whether you're doing dishes or mowing the lawn or uh, writing code or plumbing a toilet or crunching numbers in a spreadsheet, whatever work it is that you are doing, you ought to work in such a way so that when you're done, you can step back and say, man, that's some good work if I do say so myself. That's how we find enjoyment. We've got to see that our work is good. But in verse 26, the writer makes clear that if you're going to see good in your work, God has to see good in you. Look at verse 26. He says, For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, not so much. And that's the dilemma we all feel, isn't it? <laughs> we think, man, I don't deserve a good life. I don't deserve joy. Not after all I've done. I mean, if God were to look at me, what, what would he see? I can tell you what I see. Uh, I see a man whose heart is filled with pride and desires the praise of man. I see a man who is at times given to anger and at other times given to apathy. And I could go on and on. But the more important question this morning is what would God see if he looked at you? Maybe most importantly, what are you afraid that God would see if he were to look at you? And that's why the gospel is such good news. That's why we're here this morning. Because Jesus not only died in my place at the cross so that I might receive his pardon. Before Jesus went to that cross, he lived a perfect life so that I might receive his righteousness. And so when God looks at me, when God looks at you, if your hope and your trust is in Jesus Christ, he doesn't see the record of all your shortcomings and your sins. What that means to be given Christ's righteousness is that when God looks at you, he doesn't see all those times that you stumbled, all those times that you've fallen. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your place. Because I, I don't always love my neighbor as myself. And it's easy for me to think that God is up there shaking his head in disapproval and saying, what a moron. Why doesn't this guy love others better? But what the gospel shows me is that even though I don't love my neighbor as myself consistently, God isn't shaking his head in disapproval. Instead, God is giving me a high five of approval because Jesus loved his neighbor perfectly in my place. And Jesus not only died to give me pardon, 
He lived a perfect life to give me his righteousness. And so when God looks at me, when God looks at you, if your trust is in Jesus, if you have turned from sin and you're seeking to follow him, look, you're going to mess up. But what God sees is all the good that Jesus has done. And not only does God see all the good that Jesus has done, God also sees that you and I, we're being made good even now. The Holy Spirit is doing this work of sanctification, making us more and more like Jesus each and every day. We are growing in Jesus-like actions and habits. And so uh, we're not who we one day will be, but we also are not who we once were. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by God's grace. And so if, you know, you're struggling to find joy this morning, probably need to take another listen to the B side of the book of Ecclesiastes. Because it reminds us that joy isn't something we create. It is a gift that is given to us from the hand of God. And so when you lose your joy, you got to treat it like being lost in the woods. Don't keep wandering around looking for joy. You stop where you are and you wait for rescue to arrive. Reminds you that joy doesn't come from an easier life, but it's found in everyday life amidst the toil and the suffering and the sorrow. When your heart transitions from a posture of grasping to one that receives every good gift as coming from the hand of God. And it reminds you that if you're going to see good in your work, God must see good in you. He must see Christ in you. Because we're not good apart from him. And so I hope you know Jesus today. Because knowing Jesus is the only way you will ever know lasting joy. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for...